Now let us read God's word in Psalm 36. Psalm 36, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked (coughs) remove me. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Amen. Our text this morning is Psalm 36, verses 5 and 6. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. Our Lord's Supper meditation, beloved, is from Psalm 36, which was penned by David, the servant of the Lord, the one with whom God made that covenant with David, established in all things and sure. The psalm itself can be divided into three parts. In the first four verses, we have the total depravity of the wicked, including the line, there is no fear of God before his eyes, quoted by Paul in Romans 3. And then, in stark contrast to the total depravity of the wicked, we have the merciful character of the Lord in verses 5 through 9. And then, lastly, the earnest prayers of the psalmist in light of God's merciful character and the total depravity of the wicked round about him. The key word in the middle of the psalm is loving kindness, a very important Hebrew word. It's found three times. First, at the start of verse 5, thy mercy or loving kindness, O Lord, is in the heavens. Then at the start of verse 7, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O Lord. Then the prayer that flows from this at the start of verse 10, O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee. And God's loving kindness to us, beloved, especially as the recipients of the whole Bible, very clearly comes through the cross of our Savior, 
That's where loving kindness is manifested specially. And then that in turn is signified and sealed to us this morning as a gift of God's love in the Lord's Supper. Let's look together at God's loving kindness to us. First, we're going to note that this is a covenant blessing. And second, we'll consider our perspective on it. God's loving kindness to us. A covenant blessing and our perspective. Thy mercy begins our text. Thy mercy, or loving kindness, O Lord, is in the heavens. And God's mercy, or loving kindness, is his tender affection. It's an affection in God and it's very tender. And God, of course, is the one who is tenderly affected, first of all, towards himself, because he is the ever-blessed God. And how could God not be tenderly affected towards himself? The Father looks upon the Son of his bosom with tender affection in the Holy Spirit. The Son looks back to his Father as one tenderly affected towards him in the Holy Ghost. And the thrice holy God is also tenderly affected to us even though we're sinners. And he can do this because he sees us in Jesus Christ, the beloved one, to whom he is tenderly affected. And then, as viewed in Christ and accepted in the Beloved, God sees us in our misery and is tenderly affected towards his people. This loving kindness of God towards us, we who are sinners, is exalted and heavenly. It's vast and infinite, and this is what David rejoices in, Because he says, thy mercy, thy loving kindness, thy tender affection, O Lord, is in the heavens. And in so speaking, David is engaging in worship. Because he's addressing God and extolling him and saying to God, with love in his heart, thy mercy, O Lord. Thy mercy to me and all the church is in the heavens. And included in this worship is also gratitude because David is saying here, as all the people of God say, this is the loving kindness that I need. (coughs) This is the loving kindness that I have received from my hand because this God is merciful to me, a sinner. And after speaking of God's loving kindness, which is the principal grace spoken of in our text, David then extols the Lord's faithfulness. And by the faithfulness of God, or truth, sometimes it's translated that way, we're referring to the fact that God is firm and stable and constant and sure. The faithfulness and truth of God The one who's firm and constant and true and faithful as the eternal and all-powerful and wise and gracious God. His faithfulness, we are told, is in the clouds, high above us. Something that's so lofty we can never really comprehend it. And when David in verse 5, couples or pairs God's mercy and God's faithfulness or truth, he's doing it in such a way that it is not at all arbitrary. When you see mercy or loving kindness coupled with faithfulness or truth, you know, because the Bible teaches you to think this way, that it's speaking about the covenant. And it's as truly speaking about the covenant, even though the word is not found in the psalm. I could show this to you amongst many other places. 
from Psalm 25, verse 10, which is the first reference to God's covenant in the Psalms. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. The two words in the first verse of our text. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Every last one of them. Unto such as keep his covenant. To the elect, if they walk in obedience, keep God's covenant and don't break it. All the paths of the Lord are filled with mercy and truth. You see this even more clearly in Psalm 89, which goes a bit further. And it's opening verses. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. And with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness unto all generations. The same two words again. Verse 2. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness, again the same two words, shalt thou establish in the very heavens. And then, without changing the subject, the psalmist says, uttering God's words, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant. So here's the idea. The mercy and faithfulness of God come in a covenant and they come in God's covenant with David the same one who writes our text this morning this is how it all boils down God is not only merciful that is tenderly affected towards us and faithful towards us but that mercy is firm stable and constant in the bond of the covenant the covenant here made with David which points to God's new covenant with us in the blood of Jesus Christ we could read verse 5 this way without doing any violence to it but instead bringing out what is its true meaning thy covenant Loving kindness, O Lord, is in the heavens. And thy covenant faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. David, who penned these words, you see, is gripped by God's covenant mercy and faithfulness to him. He remembers Psalm, 2 Samuel 7. When God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, David, a covenant with your house, with all mercy and faithfulness flowing to you, and that the Messiah will be born as a descendant of your line. And then David humbly prays to God, saying, O Lord, who am I? I'm just a shepherd boy, taken from amongst all the people of Israel, the church. And you've made me king. And you've made a covenant with me. Such that the son of God will come from my loins. And who am I, O Lord, to receive mercy like this? And here he is in Psalm 36, adoring God. Saying, thy covenant mercy, O Lord, it's in the heavens. Thy faithfulness reaches even unto the clouds. And then David turns to God's righteousness. Thy righteousness, because he isn't finished yet, it's, an, it's like the great mountains. And if you ask what righteousness is, the one word which opens it all up is standard. Righteousness is conformity to a standard, a moral standard. And God, being entirely self-sufficient, has for his own righteousness himself as the standard. Nothing outside himself. And God's righteousness is his unswerving commitment to himself as his own standard. So that in all of the thinking and willing and acting of the Almighty, 
He's in perfect agreement with his own nature, with his own sovereignty, with his own eternity, with his own love, and with his own holiness. That's the righteousness of God. And David here, after speaking of God's covenant mercy and covenant faithfulness, mentions righteousness because he's telling us that God's covenant faithfulness and mercy must always be righteous. God cannot, and this is where the whole of liberalism, both in the church and the world, goes haywire. God cannot be unjust in pitying and delivering sinners like us. He cannot be. He's righteous, always righteous. And so when God pities and shows mercy and is loving kindly to us, he must do it in a way that keeps and fits with who he is, the holy and perfectly pure one. This is why the whole of the Old Testament makes no sense and collapses under its own weight without the wonder of the cross. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalm 85 verse 10. At the cross of our Saviour. Because God found a righteous way to show loving kindness and mercy to sinners. When our sins were imputed or reckoned to Jesus Christ, who is God and man in one divine person, and he bore the punishment due to us for them. And then his righteousness is imputed or reckoned to us. And we receive that merely by believing. So that God's loving kindness and mercy are perfectly righteous. And David here says that God's righteousness is like the great mountains, soaring, towering high above us. You look up and you feel so small. You see the mighty, majestic righteousness of God. Having considered in turn God's loving kindness and God's faithfulness and God's righteousness, we come now to his judgments, plural. And here we move more from attributes of God to God's activity. Even the word judgments indicates that. When it speaks here of God's judgments, it refers to his divine adjudications, both positively and negatively. So that God, in his judgments, and in his adjudications, on the one hand, justifies, declares righteous, and delivers. And on the other hand, God condemns and destroys. Thy judgments, thy divine adjudications, are a great deep. And God's judgments or adjudications include his sentence upon the fallen angels, condemning them justly for their wicked rebellion, and his casting them out of heaven upon Christ's ascension so that they ne have no longer any sort of access to the courts of God. God's judgments or adjudications include every activity in the conscience of man whereby he either accuses himself or excuses what he has done. God's adjudications or judgments include that sentence which every human being knows in himself either that he is declared righteous or justified by God or that he is condemned by God. Because everyone knows where they stand, including all the hardened on God who pretend very much the opposite. God's adjudications are seen in the pages of the Bible whenever he delivers his church or his saints in a million and one different ways, and whenever he destroys 
the reprobate wicked. Thy judgments, thy adjudications, O Lord, include, of course, the final judgment of all of humanity and all of angeldom on the last great day. And what David is saying here in Psalm 36 is that these divine judgments or adjudications all stand in the servant, the service of God's covenant and his covenant mercy and faithfulness. If you think of Genesis 19, when the Lord consumed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and delivered righteous Lot with the angels dragging him out of that filthy city. That was an adjudication of God. When God destroyed Babylon in his wrath, so as to deliver the Jews, who would then, through the Persians, be returned to the promised land, that was a judgment, an adjudication by God. And there was especially a divine judgment or adjudication at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, where God judged, that's the salvation of my elect. And that's the condemnation of the reprobate world. And David here speaks in the next part of the text of the purpose and result of God's covenant adjudications. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast and literally it's stronger than that it says O Lord thou savest thou savest man and beast not every man head for head any more than it means that God saves every beast head for head and when David here says O Lord thou art the one who saves man and beast he's especially thinking of the covenant with Noah. And the covenant that God made with David is a development and unfolding of a covenant that was earlier made with Noah. Different administrations of God's one everlasting covenant of grace. Because that, according to our text, is what the flood was. It was a covenantal adjudication. The God in heaven sends forth his judgment. He drowns the impenitent ungodly and floods the planet. And on the other hand, saves Noah and his family and a selective representation of the beasts in the ark and the planet. Saves the planet too which dried out over some weeks and months afterwards and made it new and different from what the planet was before because the old world, 2 Peter 3 says, being overflowed with water, perished. And we see the greater reality of this in the salvation of the new heavens and the new earth when the whole earth is renewed and the world of the elect is saved perfectly with the people of God represented in every kindred and tribe and nation and tongue and all sorts of beasts present in a covenant of friendship with humanity and among themselves. So that the lion lies down with the lamb, as Isaiah says. And if you say, how do I put all that together? We'll go back and think about the fall. Adam sinned, and so man is cursed. But then since Adam is the head of the creation, the beasts, they're under the curse too, as is the earth. So it too, that planet, our planet, is brought under the bondage of corruption. If the head falls, the animals and the whole created order is under the curse. And then, in the salvation found in Jesus Christ, elect man is saved, the head of the creation, which means the liberation of the planet and the beasts 
in a new world in the age to come. That's one way of thinking in terms of man's headship. And another way to conceive of it is through Jesus Christ's lordship. He is over all, exalted on the throne of glory, and therefore a saviour of the church and the ruler of the planet, including the animals and the fish and the birds. O Lord, thou savest man and beast through all the different judgments and adjudications. <coughs> And you say, well, who can understand all of this? All of these divine sentences in the consciences of human beings and in the history of the world, involving individuals and nations and families and always just and never cruel. And how they all serve God's covenant and how they sometimes seem even to believers to be unfair and how they practically always seem to be the wicked, to be terrible, David says, thy judgments are a great deep. They're an ocean. A deep, deep ocean. Unfathomable. And the best the puny man can do, looking at the ocean, is he can see the little bit that's in front of him. And even with the little bit that's in front of him, he can see its surface. And maybe, if it's not too tossed up, you may be able to see a few feet down. And that's all we ever get to see in this world. Thy judgments are a great deep. And if you put the imagery of the text together, and you think, I wonder how, in terms of our geography in Northern Ireland, where would be the best idea of a vista. You could say, and you'll see what I'm getting at in a minute, that the best place to stand might be, let's say, Newcastle in County Down. Standing there, you say, God's mercy or loving kindness is in the heavens. And then you look up. That's God's mercy to me in the covenant of grace. And then you say God's faithfulness in the covenant, that reaches onto the clouds. When you've practically always got clouds there. And then you turn around and say thy righteousness, and this is where it breaks down a little, is like the great mountains. You've got the mountains of Morn. They're not that great, but it's the best you can do in our wee country. And then you turn around again and look down and say thy judgments they're a great deep looking out to the Irish Sea though it's not the deepest and not an ocean and since this hardly approaches the greatness of the earthly mountains or the earthly depths you could transport yourself a bit further afield and survey God's glorious covenant from the perspective of coastal Chile that was the best place in the planet that I could think of for the vista of our text. And you can look up there, as you can do anywhere, to the heavens and say, that's the covenant mercies of God. It needs to be very high. Otherwise, it would never save me. And the clouds, the faithfulness of Jehovah. He's faithful to me and he's always been and he always will be. And then you can really look around the great mountains and look up at the Andes and say, you know, there, there, are, there are mountains, majestic, soaring. And then in terms of God's adjudications and judgments, deep and unscrutable, they're like the depths of the southern Pacific. And this may help us give some idea of the majesty of God's earth <coughs> and God's sky, which are designed in the terminology and thought world of the Bible to point us to the majesty that's far greater of the covenant 
of God with believers and their seed. And then for a third vista, a better one yet, we come to the cross of our Savior. God's mercy, God's loving kindness are in the heavens. And you see the Lord Jesus lifted up on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth. The idea is that he is rejected there by both. Mankind says we don't want him. He's not worthy to live. We don't want his feet on this planet. We're going to hang him up. And heaven says, in effect, we don't want him either. We don't want him. Rejected and abandoned. And this is the covenant mercy of God for us because he's bearing the punishment and the divine adjudication for us. And high above the cross is the heavens. And God's mercy is being revealed from heaven through the substitutionary sufferings of the Son. And there were great mountains there on that day. And you're not to think, oh, is he saying Golgotha was a, was a hill or something? That's not the point. The great mountains of righteousness, the soaring, majestic, Mountains of the righteousness of God, where the righteous one righteously dies for the unrighteous in order to bring us back to God. Besides these great mountains and the clouds, the vast heavens, there were at the cross great oceanic depths, the deep inscrutable judgments the divine adjudication that most of the people who were there didn't even see they saw the exact opposite we've got him he's dead he's cursed by God thank God it's all over that horrible movement that that imposter and cheat Jesus brought about finished but God had judged Jesus guilty from a totally different perspective. And God sentenced him to an accursed death justly because our sins were reckoned to him and God said, guilty, you must die. And there at the cross too, we were adjudged righteous. As righteous as the very righteousness of God which Jesus is earning for us. And which is imputed or reckoned to the account of each and every one who believes. And here at the cross, God is saving man and beast. Saving man and beast. He's saving elect man directly. The pardon of sins. And deliverance. And he's saving the beasts and the created order indirectly. Because in that man is saved as the head of the creation under Christ, God saves the world. The brute creation. So finally we have the perspective of our text from the Lord's Supper. What is the vista what is the view? What do we see here? What do you see? You see, merely, oh, there's a table. And it's made of wood. I see a table. And I have loads of tables in the world. I have a table in my house. And everybody has a table in their house. Tables. And we see bread. What's bread? Very common. Stores in this country filled with bread. All around the world, bread. And wine. People have been drinking wine for hundreds and thousands of years. Is that all you see? And then we've got men. Two elders going to pass around the bread and the wine. Very ordinary. Or do you see, and this is what faith sees, and this is what faith sees in connection with our text this morning, 
do you see, yes, there are physical elements, signs and seals there, but they're covenant seals. I see vast heavens and lofty clouds of God's covenant mercy and faithfulness. And he comes to me very weak and frail. And he says, eat and drink this in remembrance of my son. And do you see soaring mountains and deep oceans of the righteousness of God and his vindication and his adjudication for your salvation in Jesus Christ? That's what you must see. Believe, eat, drink. And when you see this vista, by faith alone in Jesus Christ, you say with David, and you say now in your heart, how excellent is thy loving kindness and tender mercies, O God. No wonder the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They're all going to be abundantly satisfied with the fatness and prosperity of thy house in the church. And God will make them drink of the river of his pleasures. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word and make us worthy partakers of the body and blood of thy Son. Amen.